So here I am on a beautiful lake near a beautiful island. The water is um, very calm. The water is very calm. And the sky is clear. Ah, there's a cloud, but not too many clouds in the sky. There's a little bit of wind. You can probably hear that. That's why there's waves on the water. Otherwise, this lake would be super calm. But wherever I go in nature, I see the principle of incommensurability. Okay, and in this case, I see there's stillness and motion in this scene. Okay, stillness and motion are incommensurate principles. Stillness is not motion, and motion is not stillness. So in the scene, you see stillness in the embodiment of the trees, which are static. They are, they are grounded by the root system. And then you see the water, which is in motion. And the water is, is not grounded. Okay, the water doesn't need to be grounded. Motion doesn't need to be grounded. But stillness needs to be grounded. Okay, you know, the trees in themselves are an, are an embodiment of the principle of incommensurability because the trees that you see are expanding into space. Okay, tree growth is, is an expansion process. It's a fractal expansion process. So the surface area of the tree continuously expands as it's growing. Now the roots, the roots are moving towards counter space. Okay, the roots, which, which uh, ground the trees literally into the ground, are, move, are moving towards counter space. They are also, they're moving towards nutrients, but in general, this is why roots go down and branches of trees go up is because the branches of the trees are moving towards space and the roots of the trees are moving towards counter space. Now in terms of stillness and motion as incommensurate principles, it's, which is obvious, it's obvious that the water represents motion and the trees represent stillness. And without stillness, there would be, motion would be very difficult to detect. Without the stillness of the trees on a calm day like today, um, the motion would be very difficult to detect. So stillness and motion are incommensurate principles and without motion, without stillness, motion would be very difficult to detect. So stillness is the locus with which motion can be detected. So one more thing I want to talk about, or one more thing I want to mention about that I mentioned in the last video about um, stillness uh, in motion, and I said that in order for the water to be moving, the wind has to be blowing, and in order for the trees to be moving, the wind has to be blowing. And I think I think the most important thing that I forgot to say regarding that is that the wind is invisible okay the wind is invisible you can't see the wind i can see the water i can see the trees but it's the wind that makes the water move and it's the wind that makes the trees blow and you can't see the wind i can hear the wind you might be able to hear it right now it just picked up a little bit you can hear the wind with ears you can hear the wind but with your eyes, you can't see the wind. And yet, the wind is making the water move. And uh, very subtly right now, because it's not very strong, is making the trees move. Okay, not very much today, because it's a beautiful day and it's not very windy. But I think that's an important point. Because it is my opinion that the ether exists. And it's my opinion that is the ether that makes things move that we are at rest with respect to the ether. In fact, it's the ether that makes things move. And yet we can't see the ether and we could barely detect it. The Michelson-Morley experiment couldn't detect the ether because we're at rest with respect to the ether. So just because you can't see the wind 
doesn't mean the wind isn't moving the water. And just because we can't see the wind doesn't mean the wind isn't blowing those trees over there. Okay. So I just wanted to make that point. When I'm out in a beautiful lake on a rubber dinghy by myself and at peace and looking at nature, things become more clear. It's easier to think out here, it's easier to get ideas, and it's easier to actually see what nature is doing when you're looking at nature. If you want to understand nature and how the universe works, you have to look at nature. There's no other way. You have to look at nature. And so that's what I do. So here I am in, in a super calm bay where the water is basically not in motion. Okay, when the water is not in motion, then you can see the stillness of the trees for the most part in the water. What I'm also noticing now are the, um, the bugs. Okay, now, now that the water is in stillness, so now the water is in stillness and the trees are in stillness, what I'm noticing, and you might not be able to see it in this video, but I'm noticing um, all the motion that is going on on top of the water. Okay, I see uh, dragonflies flittering around, and I see these little bugs. Hopefully we'll see one go by. These little bugs floating on the water that create kind of a wake in the water. Okay, here's a couple of dragonflies coming, or that's one dragonfly, I think, right there. Or maybe it's two of them mating. I think it's actually two of them mating. Just flew away. Okay, so in terms of the principle of incommensurability, okay, stillness is, is a relative thing. So water, just because water can move, doesn't mean that water is always moving. And just because the trees are in stillness, doesn't mean the trees are always not moving. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to sound very obvious, but in order to, say, move the trees, the wind must be blowing. Okay. In order to move the water, the wind must be blowing. Or a boat must go by, or something, or I need to wave my paddle back and forth. So when I wave my paddle back and forth, we can see a wave being created while I'm moving the paddle back and forth. Now Ken Wheeler says something really important, I think it's important, is that, um, you know, a light bulb doesn't emit a wave. Any more than me waving this paddle back and forth emits a wave. Okay, me waving this paddle back and forth is creating a wave in the water, and that wave in the water is moving away from the paddle. And it is spreading out in a spherical fashion. You can see that right there very nicely. So I think that's an important point he makes. If, this, if my paddle, waving a paddle, waves the medium and creates a wave, then whatever's going on inside the light bulb, basically the electrons are moving back and forth and wiggling the medium, causing a wave to be created and propagate in the medium. Okay, so there's no reason why light should behave any, di any more differently as a medium than me waving this paddle in the medium of water. So I believe there is a medium for the propagation of light, and I believe that when the electrons are resonated, when the electrons are vibrated, okay, when the electrons are vibrated, then they create a wave in the medium. And we perceive that, we perceive that as photons for some reason. But I don't think photons exist. I believe that it's resonant frequencies that cause electrons to jump up a level to phase transition into 
another configuration just like in cymatics where you you know you change the frequency and then the pattern in the sand um, changes at a different frequency so I believe that um, there is a medium for the propagation of light and that when you wave the medium that it is going to wave something else causing it to wiggle and change its um, configuration so I didn't intend to talk about light but it came up so I figured I would bring that up regardless it's a very beautiful day and uh, I just thought I'd share that with you thank you